Good morning and welcome to Good Food Unearthed. Uh, I'm here today with Dr. Sarai Stanchik. Um, she is a board certified physician and founder of Stancic Health and Wellness, a lifestyle medicine practice in New Jersey. And she has special training as an internist and infectious disease specialist. And she advocates for change in healthcare and is the executive producer of Code Blue, a feature length documentary that reveals the insufficiencies in the current state of medicine. So welcome to the channel, Dr. Uh, Stancic. Thank you so much, Amy. It's a great pleasure to be with you. Thank you. Um, I want to read a quote that I got off of your website, which I, I think sums up a lot of what your work focuses on. And it goes like this. Uh, we must redefine how we practice medicine in the 21st century in order to meet the needs of a changing healthcare landscape. And this is uh, from an article that you wrote uh, to nutritionstudies.org. And that is, um, when we know better, we must do better. And I believe uh, Maya Angelou has also said the same thing, that when we know better, yeah, we must do better. Um, so I wanna talk about uh, multiple sclerosis to begin with. Um, so I continue to hear about multiple sclerosis here on local and national radio and uh, it's stated as an incurable disease. Uh, they don't know what causes it, and there's really not much anybody can do to stop the progression of it. Um, so I'm wondering if um, you could tell us a bit about your story, because I know you were diagnosed with MS back in 1995. Uh, would you be willing to share some of that story with us? Sure, absolutely. So in 1995, and, and at that point, I was a third year medical resident. I had just turned 28 years old. Um, it was actually October 11th. Uh, I was on call at the hospital and it was a very, very busy night. And I can recall being very, very tired. And sometime around the mid morning hours, I finally found an opportunity to, to get back to the on call room to take a brief nap. And um, Shortly after you know that nap, I was paged to address another urgent patient matter, and when I tried to get up out of that sleeping position, I couldn't feel my legs, and it was that acute and that abrupt. Um, I remember trying to step down to, to get help, and it felt as if I was stepping down on a, on a bed of nails or hot coals. It was just really traumatic, and um, next thing I knew, I was in the emergency room undergoing an MRI of my brain and spinal cord, and those studies confirmed the diagnosis of MS, and and it was um, really quite shocking. You know, just a few hours earlier, I was this young, healthy woman, and all of a sudden, I was a chronic illness patient. And uh, with that came a very difficult period in my life. Uh, I was uh, immediately started on, at the time, there was one drug approved by the FDA um, under the category of disease-modifying therapies. Today, we have, I think, close to 15 medicines, but back then, there was only one. Uh, and it was an injectable drug that I had to administer uh, every evening, and it had a lot of side effects. Um, and those side effects led to other medications. And I found myself within, you know, eight years of the diagnosis, I was taking nearly a dozen drugs, and um, my disease had regressed to the point, Amy, that I was dependent on a cane or, or a set of crutches. So uh, things were not going well for me. Uh, I was really struggling and, and I was really had lost hope. And then by chance, uh, remarkably, and here, and, and again, a reminder, I'm a practicing physician, attending physician, uh, and really didn't understand much about nutrition. But by chance in 2003, I came across an article that uh, discuss the importance of diet in, a, in MS. And I was sort of shocked by this because uh, none of my physicians who were experts in the field of MS ever talked to me about my diet or lifestyle. Um, and, and when I approached them to discuss the article and the literature that I had come across, they sort of dismissed it as, as not being very important. But I guess because I was uh, in such dire straits and, and feeling um, you know, really frustrated by my quality of life, I, I, this, this was like a, was like a, a, a glimmer of hope for me. It was, it was light in a really dark tunnel. So it stimulated uh, an interest in, in understanding and researching and reading as much as I could. And the more I read, the more excited I became, uh, understanding that this was powerful. And um, despite my physicians not being able to speak to this, 
I knew that at some point it was important. So in 2003, against doctor's recommendations, I decided that I was going to responsibly um, uh, taper off of all of those medicines that I was on, and I was going to focus 100% of my attention to optimizing every aspect of my lifestyle. So uh, I, the first thing I did was I, I adopted a primarily plant-based diet. Um, you know, I removed processed foods and reduced animal sources, and um, I enriched my plate with whole, you know, whole foods, fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, nuts, and seeds. And I did this not because it was the fad diet of the day or because it was popular. I did this because the overwhelming body of evidence and the scientific literature pointed to a diet rich in plants as being the ideal diet, not just for MS or for diabetes or for heart disease, but for all of us. Um, and I began to exercise. Uh, back in 1995, when, we were, when a patient was diagnosed with MS, we were told not to exercise. At that point, it was falsely believed to exacerbate the disease. And MS patients really struggle with fatigue. So my doctors would tell me to rest and to conserve my energy. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, began, I worked on my sleep. Uh, for years, I was addicted to hypnotic medications like Ambien that my doctors would prescribe to me. So I had to learn how to create a really healthy sleep environment in my home and, 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 and learn how to sleep without taking a drug. And that was really, really hard. But uh, over time, I, I, I really... Um, addressed and, and improved every aspect of my life and, and you know the remarkable thing is that I started to feel better and uh, for years I didn't feel my legs or I had pain and I started to notice that I that, that I could go a day without a cane or I could stay up you know past eight o'clock at night and, and feel energized and and, um, and it was just uh, in many ways uh, miraculous for me to be able to you know we gained control of my health by making these modifications. And um, I went from that in 2003, a woman who was dependent on 12 drugs and, and cane and crutches. And in 2010, I, I crossed the finish line at a marathon. So it's, it, you know, in a nutshell, that's my story. And it's in large part why I'm so passionate about this idea of lifestyle and delivering this message to as many uh, in my community and beyond on a global scale that, you know, there's nothing magical about what I did. Um, it's something we can all do and it's empowering. And, and so my focus is really delivering this message to uh, as many as are willing to hear it. Well, thank you uh, for that story. It is really amazing. Uh, and I, I don't know about you, but um, when I did some research into this, and I, I'm wondering if we, you could talk a bit about some of the research that you discovered. Yeah. But with MS in particular, um, it's something like 50% of people who are diagnosed with MS within 10 years, they can either not walk unassisted or wheelchair bound or bed bound or dead. Um, and yeah. yet there are studies that show there is something you can do with the food that you're eating uh, to actually stop the progression of MS. Yeah, so MS is an interesting disorder because um, no two patients are alike. So outcomes um, are, there's, there's a, a real spectrum. But yes, you know, back when I was diagnosed in 1995, my doctor um, present, presented that very uh, same um, prognosis to me. He said to me at, uh, at the time when I remember being admitted in the hospital and being in the hospital bed, and he said to me, you know, within 10 years, you're likely to be in a wheelchair or in a nursing home setting, and this is something that you need to prepare for. So, um, you know, obviously that was difficult to hear at age 28, but you're right. Um, this is the, the obvious uh, uh, concern, but, you know, back in 2003, uh, one of the first studies that I came across was an article published in 1952 in the New Journal of Medicine by physician named Royce Wang, who was a neurologist who had a, an interest in MS, and, and he wrote an article that discussed the incidence of MS in Norway. And interestingly, Norway has one of the highest rates of MS on a global scale. 
and he studied that community and he noted that the highest rates were in the inner farming dairy communities that the individuals were eating the most what he called saturated fat butter fat as he compared this to those that were living on the coast that were eating primarily fish and vegetation they had much lower rates of ms and back in 1952 he concluded that somehow saturated fat in the diet was playing a role in increased risk of MS and also in worse, worsening outcomes in those living with MS. He went on, actually, he didn't leave it just that hypothesis. Dr. Swank practiced in Portland, Oregon, and he actually treated, back in the 1950s, um, beginning in the 1950s, he started treating patients with a low-fat plant-based diet. And he actually followed 140 patients and reported on them after 20 years for the first time in the archives of neurology in 1970. But he didn't stop there. He followed those very same patients an additional 14 years and ultimately published his findings in the journal The Lancet in 1990. And he concluded after following 140 plus patients over 34 years that those that adhered to his diet had significantly uh, less mortality, and 95% of patients remain disability-free. That was extraordinary to hear that uh, when I read those words, and, um, and, and that was really what fueled my interest moving forward. And yes, you're right, there's a lot of literature that points to, to there's an interesting article that was published in, in the journal Neurology that looked at patients living with multiple sclerosis. If you have multiple sclerosis, and a, a cardiometabolic endpoint like diabetes or obesity or hypertension, the, the time that you, that from, from the point of your diagnosis to your needing a cane or crutch is hastened by six years versus those that just have MS. So what we're learning is that you know, these um, inflammatory uh, cardiometabolic diseases like diabetes and hypertension are playing a role in worsening outcomes in MS. There's another study published in 2015 that actually proposed cholesterol as potentially being a biomarker of disease activity in patients with MS. So if you have MS and your cholesterol is elevated, your outcomes will be worse. So there are these connections between um, uh, obesity, smoking, cardiometabolic endpoints that not only increase your risk of MS, but also if you're living with MS, will worsen outcomes. Um, so, and, and I think it's regrettable that uh, currently today, most patients who are diagnosed with MS and are evaluated by an MS specialist are simply uh, prescribed uh, one of these disease modifying therapies and if there and these other issues are not addressed. So, and I think that's suboptimal care. If you have an MS patient that is also pre-diabetic and, and obese and hypertensive and as an MS specialist, all you can do is write for a disease modifying therapy and you're ignoring this other part of the patient, that to me that's, uh, that's suboptimal care, bordering on malpractice really, because we have so much evidence that speaks to the power of addressing these parameters in regards to improving uh, quality of life of those living with MS. I find it interesting um, as well. I, I, from, I, from my experience and from talking to people, uh, it seems that even, and in your case as well, I think you brought up with your neurologist, that patients do tend to ask their physicians, is there anything I can do? Like, is there anything I can uh, change? Can I change what I'm eating or, or something like this, something that's in their power for them to do? Um, so it's, it, it, the question is posed, but I think uh, they're given the answer that there's not much you could do, eat whatever you want and just try to, you know, make the right. best of it. I think that's a great point, and 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 again, I think that's that's sort of what fuels me, and and what you know what drives my passion is because you know when I, at that point when I was you know again diagnosed at age 28, terrified and and scared, and when I asked my doctor, who again was you know one of the leading experts in the field of of multiple sclerosis, he said to me there was nothing else I could do, and he told me that changing my diet wasn't going to in any way change the course of my disease. And again, it's not because he's a bad doctor or a bad person. He just do doesn't know. And, and you know, we, we started this conversation when you quoted Maya Angelou, when we know better, we do better. And that's where we are today. We, there's enough evidence in the literature that points to the importance of this. And um, it may be 
that, and again, this is part of why I made the film and why I, you know, I travel across the country speaking on the topic is that we need to change the way we train our doctors and the way we train our healthcare professionals because currently um, in medical schools, we're not, we're not talking about nutrition. We're not talking about the power of lifestyle. And um, this, is, this is absurd at this point. The evidence is overwhelming. And um, there are medical schools that are beginning to have conversations and changing things. There's a wonderful school in, in, that we feature in, in Code Blue at the University of South Carolina in Greenville that is a, is a medical school that was opened about six years ago and it is built on the principles of lifestyle medicine. So they're doing it right, right from the start. And, and they're teaching their, their, uh, their medical students the importance of lifestyle and it's integrated throughout their four years there. Uh, which is extraordinary. It's a, it's a wonderful example um, that we should all follow. I was just, I just got back yesterday from Loma Linda uh, uh, where we screened the film and I had an opportunity to, to visit their medical school. Loma Linda is another wonderful example where they're, they've integrated lifestyle medicine into the of their medical school and they're producing positions that are what I call evolved and awakened and, and can speak to the power lifestyle medicine. Of course, with all of that said, we have to also teach uh, the importance of pharmaceuticals are very important in managing disease and, and all the amazing procedures and advances that we have in clinical medicine. Of course, all of that is important. But if we don't also include this, this um, important, the importance of prevention and, and the importance of empowering patients by modifying their behaviors, then I think, again, we're, we're, we're missing a key and important aspect of Okay. Great. And so um, you talk, we're talking a little bit about Code Blue now. Um, and you say like, uh, this is a part of what spurred you to uh, start the documentary. I believe you're the ex you were the executive producer of the film. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about Code Blue. I, I haven't seen it myself. I know you just started screening it and there's been some very successful uh, screenings this year. Um, but could you tell us a bit about um, the project and uh, some key takeaway points from the film? Yeah, so um, I guess four years ago, a film, the filmmaker Marcia Machado approached me uh, having heard my story and having heard about the work that I'm doing, um, just just to make the point that I, um, I've been practicing medicine for 25 years and, and you mentioned I, I began my career as an internist and infectious disease specialist uh, about six years ago, um, in large part um, because of my personal story and just also uh, in practicing medicine over so many years and just seeing so much pain and suffering that I know is largely preventable, you know, seeing the stroke and the, and the heart attack or the, uh, the infected diabetic foot evolving into an amputation. These are the things that I was seeing every day in clinical practice and, and knowing that, you know, nearly 93% of diabetes is preventable and yet it's a disease that is exploding across our country. I felt that I needed to, in the latter half of my career, uh, focus on delivering this message in any way I could. So I decided to open uh, a small lifestyle medicine practice and, and my uh, initiative would be to empower patients to, uh, to take control of their personal health, just as I had. Uh, helping diabetics uh, taper off medicines. And, you know, diabetes is, we can, we can reverse this disease by modifying our behaviors. I think the average individual doesn't understand that. And, and so I was doing this, and, and when she approached me, the filmmaker, she said, you know, your story is remarkable, and I would love to, to tell it in, in a documentary. And I said, well, I appreciate, uh, I appreciate that. Um, I'm happy to share my story, but I think the bigger story and the more important story is the fact that we're not learning this in medical school. And, and I would love to make a film with you and, and shed light on that so that maybe we can begin a discussion. We can, we can, we can meet with those that are, are creating curricula in medical schools and, and maybe have a discussion about how, what we need to do to make it better to ensure that we train physicians. And of course, it's not just physicians, it's all healthcare professionals, nurses and physical therapists and pharmacists. We, we should all be part um, of that uh, education. 
So uh, we agreed that we would partner and, and we, would, um, we would tell the story. And we worked over four years on, on the film. It, it's been an extraordinary undertaking, but I'm very proud of the film. Uh, yes, it tells my story, but it also tells the story of this absurd gap, this missing piece of the puzzle that we're not getting in, in training. And, and, and I think, Amy, if we were to, to change that, if we were to train physicians that um, were aware of the power of lifestyle, and not, and not just a few physicians here and a few there, but universally, universally and ubiquitously, not just in our country here in the United States, but everywhere globally, I think that we could turn the tide of this chronic disease epidemic because we know the literature tells us that 80% of the chronic diseases that we see today in clinical practice are preventable by modifying our behaviors. And, and that's, that's extraordinary. Yeah, that it, it's, uh, it's, it seems crazy to me that you know something so simple, uh, so inexpensive, and so harmless—I mean, not just harmless, but actually beneficial without negative side effects—is uh, not encouraged uh, by physicians for their patients. Like, uh, even if you know you were to have to have some type type of medication or a surgery, right. you still want to have a healthy body to be able to you know better heal itself. Of course, yes, and 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 again, you know, I I think it's not because doctors uh, don't want to you know help patients or they're it's just that they don't know because it's just not emphasized at all. I, I mean, I, I again before the only reason and and I always say this and it sounds some of my patients say, Doctor Stancic, how could you say that? But but it's true. In many ways, MS has been a tremendous blessing for me because it led me to this awakening, right? Um, because I. I considered myself a very good physician, very dedicated to my patients, and uh, but I was incapable of delivering this all important message. And it really wasn't; it was it was my diagnosis that led me down this path. And then um, I recognized that this was something that was not only beneficial to me as a, a patient, but also that it was something that I could convey to my patients and, and help them. And, um, and it's been an amazing uh, experience for me to see patients uh, taper off of medicines and, and the joy of that. And, and it's infectious, you know, because the, the patient who, who feels, who goes from, you know, being an obese uh, diabetic and, and, and living with, with such poor quality of life and, and, and you see them evolve into this uh, joyful, um, energized person, individual, it, it's infectious because then their family members get involved and they want to make changes in their life. And, you know, they go to work and people in, in their, in their community are asking questions and, and, and they become, uh, ambassadors of this idea of lifestyle. And I, I think I've, I, I often mention this because I think it's, it's really quite remarkable and it's something that I could have never predicted when I started my practice, but I have, you know, many patients in my practice who are physicians or nurses or, or in the healthcare field. And the reason that that happened in large part was because at one point we had a patient in common, uh, you know, a diabetic or, or a patient with an autoimmune disease that had seen their, their rheumatologist or their uh, endocrinologist. And, and they see dramatic changes and improvements in their, in their patients. And then they're, they call me asking about what are you doing? How did you advise our patient? I, I see they're no longer, their hemoglobin A1C went from 10 to 5.3. They're no longer diabetic. What, what are you doing? And then we have a conversation about lifestyle and about diet. And, and I say, give me your email so I can send you the, the evidence, the literature from peer reviewed journals. And then we have a conversation and they call me back and they say, you know what, I want to come see you. And I, and I think it's a the social uh, meeting, like a cup of tea, will talk, and they say, "No, I want to come see you as a patient because I too have have health issues, and I want to improve my overall well-being." And that, for me, is really powerful because when I when I can help a doctor get healthy, that that's not only going to affect them; it's going to affect the way they practice medicine moving forward. So that's really been one of the great blessings that I I, I had not um, predicted. <laughs> I, I wonder when you were making the film Code Blue, if you came across some reasons why uh, 
nutrition hasn't really been taught in medical schools. I mean, I came across um, an interview with Dr. Roy Swank, um, who did a lot of the MS research, and he was asked, you know, why doesn't the MS society or or why don't uh, neurologists tell their patients about like your research? And um, and he said that as far as the MS society is concerned, uh, they don't mention it because they didn't discover it. Uh, it wasn't their research dollars that found the treatment, so they're not going to tell anybody. Did, did you find that when you did a um, uh, Code Blue documentary that some of the reasons why nutrition uh, maybe isn't taught is um, some egos involved, but uh, you know, aside from the egos involved, also uh, just the fear of uh, moving away from the tried and or the traditional ways of practicing medicine. Yeah, I, I, yeah, all those questions, those are all important questions, and they were all questions that I seek to, to answer. And it was challenging. I think, I, I think one of the disappointments, and, and if you, when you watch the film, you'll, you'll see. Um, I sort of, at, towards the end of the film, I, you can almost see my frustration and I, I, I somewhat get a little bit emotional because I think a lot of the answers that I was getting um, from some of the experts that I, that I was interviewing was that at, at the end of the day, it's really profit mm -hmm. uh, that drives, um, drives it all. And, and to me, that, that's just unacceptable. Uh, I, I just don't see, you know, the field of medicine to me, um, must remain altruistic. We must act in what is what is right for our patients. And, um, for example, one of the things that we, we we cover in the film is that the most profitable procedure in any hospital is open heart surgery, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cabbage, uh, and and so <clears throat> there are there are um, financial reasons why the status quo uh, uh, makes everyone happy. I guess I don't I don't know, um, but I don't believe I don't believe that any physician is sitting around um, cheerful that someone has coronary artery disease. I, I don't believe that. I, I believe that um, the reason that it's it's not become mainstream in front and center uh, is because doctors just don't understand it, and I and I think that once you educate, doctors will 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 uh, prescribe accordingly. Um, I, you know, but it, it is, there, there are, finan there are financial reasons, I'm sure. Uh, and it's also the way the, the structure of the curriculum right now, for example, here's, there, here's one of the reasons why I think nutrition education, um, hasn't made, um, mainstream curricula is that the national board of medical examiners, the questions that are created don't cover nutrition or lifestyle and medical schools are going to teach what's on the, the boards because they want their students to do well. It reflects on their, uh, on them. Mm -hmm. So we need to, you know, that's a, a huge hurdle. So the National Board of Medical Examiners, um, they need to, to begin to ask questions about nutrition and lifestyle because then, uh, so it's like the chicken or the egg, what, what comes first. But, but we have to bring all of these, and I think this is part, in large part also what I hope the film will do, is that I want to bring people to the table. Mm -hmm. And, you know, all of these, uh, uh, you know, key players, the, the National Board of Medical Examiners, deans of medical schools, whomever it is that um, is a critical part, just sitting down and saying, look, we're doing a lot of really great things in clinical medicine, but here's a piece that we need to address. And in a real, really respectful uh, uh, approach, let's sit down and, and let's talk about this. And, um, and I think that we can have really fruitful discussions and really um, uh, move the ball forward. And, I, and, and we can look, there are examples, like again, the University of South Carolina, Greenville, that is doing this and doing it successfully. And, and we, can, we can illustrate that example as being one that, um, that, that can be uh, utilized a, as a template for, for schools across the country and, and again, across the globe, not, not just here in the United States, but, but really uh, across the globe. So, I, and, I, and I think that it's, it's an exciting time because there's definitely, what I sense is a movement happening 
uh, and it's, it's, it's really swelling. Uh, I, I can tell you, Amy, that 10 years ago when I was talking about this, uh, there were crickets in the room and, and people, you know, didn't give me much attention. And, and the world is changing and, and uh, people are reaching out to me and asking me to speak at Grand Rounds at their medical schools. Um, you know, the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is an, is an extraordinary organization that is growing by leaps and bounds. Every year I go, there's more and more physicians joining this um, very important organization. And it's, and, and, and I think that um, as the word gets out, this idea of lifestyle medicine is becoming more and more mainstream. Um, that I, I think 20 years from now, the, the, the practice of medicine is going to be very different than, than what it is today. And, and I hope that if, uh, you know, if I have any part in, 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 um, in spreading the word, then to me that, 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 that's uh, very special. Um, if somebody wishes to screen the documentary, um, is there anything that they can do? Sure. So they can go to our website. It's codebluedoc.com. So it's um, so doc is like a double entendre documentary doc.com, and you can um, screen the you can you know click on screening uh, the film, and and we can uh, set up. If you have a community or an organization that is interested uh, in screening the film, um, that would be a great uh, way to do it. Uh, we will have, currently we're, we've applied to ser several um, film festivals. So in order to, to meet the criteria for that, we can't yet sell the film on DVD or download it yet. So that's why it's not yet available in that capacity. Right now it's just screenings, but we, we have several screenings scheduled across the country and even outside of, we, we were just in Australia and New Zealand about a week ago. So anywhere, anywhere in the globe who's interested, we, we'd love to get the film out to you and, and share it with your community. Yeah, that, uh, it's a great opportunity. I suppose if uh, maybe medical schools were interested in screening it for their students as well, they could do that. That's our goal. Uh, there are 179 medical schools in, in the U.S. and, and uh, I just got back yesterday from Loma Linda Medical School and, and on Saturday, the day before, we had a screening at, in a medical school in Texas. Um, so our hope is to get all 179 medical schools um, and, uh, and, and again, just, he, just having medical students hear the term lifestyle medicine and, and just you know, conjure up some interest, maybe plant some seeds. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been exciting to see the, um, the, the responses that we're getting from, from the screenings that have already played out. And, and uh, it's wonderful to, to have medical students send me email or call me or, and, and say to me, you know, I'm really excited about this. This is part of what I want to do. And that just, you know, feeds my soul. <laughs> um, and what advice would you give um, uh, if you could give like a piece of advice to doctors and medical students who um, right now, I suppose, with the healthcare crisis, there, I know there's one in America, it's a big one. There's one uh, here in Newfoundland locally. I'm sure they're happening uh, around uh, the world. Um, what advice would you give to doctors and medical students who are immersed in this kind of losing battle of drugs and surgery as first line treatments for chronic diseases? I, the first thing I would say is I, consider joining the American College of Lifestyle Medicine or um, because, and, it, and again, it's the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, but participants come from all over the world. And by the way, there are lifestyle medicine organizations that are, that are um, growing, uh, that are started all over the country, all over the world, you know, the Brazilian, uh, College of Lifestyle Medicine. There's, I know there's a Canadian co College of Lifestyle Medicine, uh, Korean College of Lifestyle Medicine. Every day there's a new um, organization. But the American College of Lifestyle Medicine is uh, the father organization. Um, they're celebrating their 15th year in existence this year. And again, it is a, a, a global a gathering of individuals. The next um, conference is in October of 2019. So if anybody's interested in, in attending that, I would highly recommend it, or at least visit their website, become familiar. Uh, there are you know, conferences and, and lectures that, that are given uh, all over the country throughout the year. Uh, I, I'm, I'm actually one of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine 
uh, speakers and, and so I get invited to speak in different parts of, of the country on behalf of the American Cultural Lifestyle Medicine, but it's a, it's a wonderful organization. It's one of those conferences that you, you, know, you get a lot of science mm -hmm. and, and, and you also get a lot of, this is gonna sound corny, but a lot of love. You know, it's just a wonderful organization where you leave inspired. You really do, because you're you're just you're just surrounded by like-minded individuals who are doing uh, important work in their part of the world, and it's it's amazing. You'll go for breakfast in the morning, and you'll sit at a table with you know, two other people that you've never met before, and you walk away feeling like your best friends because you know they in in those 20, 30 minutes they'll they'll share what they're doing, and and you are inspired by them because of what they're doing, and it gives you ideas. And, it's just, and again, it's not just physicians, it's, it's nurses, health coaches, um, chefs, like, you know, people who are just interested in wellness and, and are doing their part in their corner of the world. So I, I would definitely, if you, could, if you could make that conference, I would highly recommend that, or, or just joining it so that you have access to the many uh, you know, journals and, and, and you know, um, webinars that are available when, as a member which I think are, are critically important. And I, I think it's a, a, a great for, um, for medical students to, you know, if, if they have this power of lifestyle medicine to prevent these chronic diseases where like nearly 80% of all of these chronic diseases can be prevented, yeah. uh, that that does free up some time for them uh, if they become a physician or a doctor or a, um, a nurse or a surgeon uh, to do, you know, to commit uh, more quality uh, into their practice and then also to be open to discovering new things because you have the time to do it. You're not stressed with all of these patients who are coming to you with these diseases that right now um, termed as chronic are, you know, they're told, patients are told you have this for the rest of your life and you just have to manage it. And right. then, you know, we'll come back and we'll take your blood tests and make sure everything's okay and that the drugs aren't adversely affecting you too much and that sort of thing. Absolutely. And, and uh, at the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, there's, uh, there's this capacity, what we call lifestyle medicine interest groups, where um, we can arrange for these groups in every medical school. And, and, and right now, I think we're up to 25, 26 medical schools that have a lifestyle medicine interest group. So that's a, and that's wonderful. But we, we, like I said, we have 179 medical schools. So we have a lot of work to do. And you know, the other thing that, that I think is very important is um, physician wellness. You know, uh, chronic diseases are, uh, physicians are not immune to chronic diseases themselves and obesity and, and, and you know, 70% of, of Americans are either overweight or obese. Uh, and, and this is in large part fueling many chronic diseases. And again, physicians are not immune to this. And, and physicians have the highest rates of suicide of any profession. Uh, and so the other part of this that I think is very important and maybe a way in which we can entice uh, deans of medical schools and administrators to listen to what we have to say is to talk about physician wellness. We need to train physicians that that not only understand the the power of li of lifestyle and nutrition for their patients, but also for themselves. Mm -hmm. We want to have healthy, happy, joyful physicians. And currently, the, even the way in which we train doctors, where they're so stressed, they're not getting enough sleep, they're eating poorly, this needs to change, right? We we need to assure that that these young men and women uh, are are getting enough sleep. And that they're not highly stressed, and, and we can teach them tools, you know, how to manage their stress, um, and that's not being done. So, I, I think that's another aspect that brings tremendous value to this is helping. I always tell uh, our our medical students, it's important for you to note that you are your first patient. Yeah, you have to learn how to take care of yourself. Uh, in order to be your very best self in, in regards, I mean, your very best uh, physician for your own patients. Mm -hmm. and so, and I think about, about it, Amy, when I, was, when I was diagnosed, no doubt that my lifestyle was contributing to the um, evolution of multiple sclerosis. I mean, I was highly stressed. I was eating out of machines because I was in the hospital, you know, bending machines. I wasn't sleeping. 
Um, I wasn't exercising because I had no time. So everything that we talk about in the lifestyle medicine prescription was being ignored um, in, in that setting. And, and that's wrong. So we need to train our, our, those of us who are leaders in, in health. Uh, and again, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about physicians, but, but I, I include everyone that is in, in the healthcare profession. Um, we need to train uh, healthcare professionals that know how to take care of themselves first and foremost, and then, and then they'll be their very best for their families and their patients. And, 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 and this idea that, that suicide rates are highest in the profession that is in charge of health in our community, to me, is unacceptable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I wonder now uh, if we could go uh, to the side of patients and what advice would you give to patients whose doctors say would ridicule or belittle the thought that nutrition plays a role in MS, lupus, rheumatoid arthritis, heart disease, Alzheimer's, diabetes, type one diabetes even. What would you say to patients whose doctors just don't think there's any correlation? I would say that's likely the case right now in 2019, but I think that's going to change in, um, and very soon because I, I know that these um, again, as I travel across the country and I meet medical students who are near graduating and so, or residents that are, that are, again, evolved and awakened, I think that's going to change soon. But, but uh, keep in mind that your physician is not that they're, they're poorly trained or that they're, un it's just that they're uninformed. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't get this in medical school, so that's why they see no value in it. It's, and again, it's not, it's not on the board, so it doesn't seem important or valuable. But um, that's going to change. There, so what I, what I would say to that individual who's interested in finding a physician that is uh, that does understand is I, I would go to organizations, again, like the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, where you can put in your zip code or your local area, and, and the, the listing of board-certified lifestyle medicine physicians will come up. There's, there's, there's somebody, I know that there's somebody in, in, um, in every state in, in our country, and I know there, I know there are physicians and many physicians in Canada, mm -hmm. uh, and and many physicians really uh, across um, the world that that are are informed, and and can and and most patients will, will be within you know a distance that they could travel to them, but but I think that, um, and the the other thing you can do is you can uh, talk to your physician and and maybe mention the American College of Lifestyle Medicine and encourage them. Uh, I, I think it's always important to present uh, evidence from peer-reviewed peer uh, journals uh, to, to, uh, to convince uh, particularly physicians that this is important. But uh, they're, they're out there. And I, and I think a good place to start would be going to an organization like ACLM and putting in your zip code. Or you can come to New Jersey and see me. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I wonder um, as well, like in your practice, uh, what do you recommend to patients with MS? Have you had uh, patients come to you with MS? Yes, actually, I see a lot of patients uh, with MS. And I recommend uh, the same thing that I would recommend to a diabetic or to, um, you know, a hypertensive or a patient that has heart disease. Uh, there, this is not complicated. It's really quite simple. And there's no special diet for MS or special diet for diabetes or it's all the same. It's all the same. I and mean, we, we need to eat more plants. And I, and I don't like, uh, I don't like the term vegan uh, because that can scare people. Um, and even sometimes Although plant-based is, is more mainstream, and uh, sometimes that even scares people. I mean, you have to consider where we are today. Um, the, the standard American diet or the Western diet is composed primarily of processed foods. 63% of our calories are coming from processed grains, 25% from animal sources of food, and only 12% of our calories are coming from anything that remotely resembles a plant. So, and, and, and if you drill down and you look at that, that sliver of the pie, that 12%, it's really only about 6% that's actually whole food plant-based. The rest of it is like apples and apple pie or nuts in a chocolate bar. Right? So, it's, yeah. so it's not really, so it's, so we're starting with that, Amy. So you can't go from that to vegan. Right. So, so for me, it's really about meeting the patient where they are and being very, always very respectful and supportive. 
and saying, you know, what are we willing to do today? First, I, I present to them, these are the, the advantages and the, the benefits of eating a diet that is rich in, in plants and rich in fiber and rich in phytonutrients and anti-inflammatory um, um, components. So I, that's what I help them to understand first. And then I say, I know where you are right now. So what can we do today to begin to move you in the direction that is going to serve you? Not just today, where maybe you're, you're here to see me for weight loss or, or for your cholesterol, but what's going to serve you from here on in that is going to allow you to age gracefully and, and live a joyful life. And that's what we want for all. I mean, the average uh, individual ends up in a nursing home, in, you know, uh, suffering with dementia or with some chronic disease. Uh, and that's, and, and what I want for every one of us is I want us to age gracefully and maybe at age 95, go out, spend a beautiful day with our family and then go to bed and not wake up. You know, that's what we want for all of us. So, um, that's really my focus is not scaring patients away saying, you know, this is a militant vegan diet. That's not what I want. But, you know, if you must eat that steak, instead of it being half of your plate, can we, can we make it a quarter of your plate? Mm -hmm. And that potato, instead of embarrassing it with sour cream and butter, could we just bake a beautiful potato and just put a little bit of, you know, salt and pepper on it and not, not add that other stuff. And then let's fill the rest of your plate with lots of colorful vegetables. Mm -hmm. We add asparagus and broccoli and carrots to that plate. So all of a sudden, the ratio on the plate has shifted. It's not, it's not primarily animal. It's now primarily plants right. and, and plants that are going to serve us. And so that's what we have to do. We have to be kind and, 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 and because we, because this is our culture, we have to change culture. And for many of us, many of my patients who come to see me, they're in their fourth or fifth decade of life and they've been living a certain way their whole lives. And, and these are beliefs that are entrenched and then that you know I have to eat that chicken or I have to eat that fish in order to get enough protein or you know I, if I don't eat that steak I'm going to become anemic I mean these are the things that I hear every day yeah. and helping them to understand that these are misconceptions and and now we know that we understand and we have the science to understand that what we need to, to, to make bring, you know changes into our lives in order to ensure that we, we live our, our best and, and most helpful existence um, but it's it's starting out with small steps in the right direction and and as culture changes then it's going to become more and more acceptable uh if you think about it a great example is smoking uh uh mm -hmm. in 1964 nearly 50 percent of, of of the american population uh, uh, the american population of adults smoked cigarettes mm -hmm. and, and it took a long time in 1964 the surgeon general told us uh, the report that smoking was deleterious to her health and was contributing to heart disease and cancer. And in large part, despite that report, most Americans continued smoking. Mm -hmm. And it took a long time. And it really wasn't until the 1990s where we created, and hospitals, by the way, were the first to remove smoking from, from their buildings. And it, that took nearly 30 years. It wasn't until 1993 that um, the standard, the Joint Commission created a standard that required all health care um, institutions to, to become smoke free. And then that triggered uh, uh, an interesting um, series of events in, in that uh, a few years later, Bill Clinton, who was the president at the time, uh, signed an executive order that required federal buildings to be smoke free. And that trickled down to uh, state and, and local governments. And then before you knew it, uh, smoking was no longer acceptable in restaurants and no longer acceptable in bars. And all of a sudden culture changed. And smoking went from something that was cool uh, and interesting to something that was not appealing at all. And, and so now we're, we're down to uh, about, I think we're about 60% of Americans smoking. It's still too much, but we've come a long way. And I think that's where we are with food. We need to, we need to bring um, attention to the deleterious effects of food and how it similarly is contributing to heart disease and cancer and, and the many chronic diseases that we see today. And as we do that, then the culture will change and, and eating hot dogs will no longer be acceptable on the 4th of July. I mean, hot dogs are, are a processed meat that is, is recognized by the World Health Organization as a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. And yet we, we eat them throughout the summer months and we feed our children these hot dogs. And I, you know, and again, I think that 
as, as more and more uh, education trickles down and, 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 and um, is disseminated through our communities, we're, we're going to be empowered and we're going to make better decisions. And I think, uh, uh, like with Dr. Dean Ornish's approach as well, is, uh, is you know, sh sharing like the positives and the benefits of um, where you, you see that what you gain from eating foods that are going to provide you with a healthy body is so much more than what you give up. So if you have Absolutely. pleasure, yeah, the pleasure of um, eating a certain meal because you get together with friends and that's the type of food you're used to eating and you right. grow to like the taste of it. Well, you can actually switch and grow to like the taste of plant-based foods, but you also, you don't feel heavy and bloated and uh, you don't gain, you know, excess weight from eating a whole food plant-based diet. So you can continue to have that joy spread long-term rather than just those short bursts of, I feel really good and no, nah, I don't feel so good now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the, and the benefits of plant-based, uh, of eating this way, and of course, the, it's, and the reason it's so important is, is you know, fiber is, is such an important part of, of a healthful diet. It's so common to see uh, patients who are chronically constipated. I mean, you know, it seems like not a very, you know, it's sort of constipated. Why are you talking about constipation? But it's a huge problem. And that's one of the first thing I can, I can tell you, Amy, sometimes I have patients come back to see me after their two, you know, their first visit and, and return, uh, you know, two weeks later or a month for a follow-up and, and they hug me and they say, oh my God, Dr. Stanzig, I'm actually having daily bowel movements. My life has changed. I, and it seems so silly, but it's, it's one of the first and most immediate benefits that people get. And you just feel so much better. Mm -hmm. um, and, and you don't have to take, you know, the fiber supplements or, or all the garbage that you've been taking or, um, or the enemas or it's just crazy. And all of a sudden they feel really, really, really great. And, and, and yes, thank you for making that point from Dr. Ornish that, you know, fear and, and, and scaring patients, that's not what we want. We want the, I want change to come from love and joy. And I think that's, that's Dr. Ornish talks about fear not being sustainable. That's not what we want. We want patients to understand that this is something, and, and, and you can go at your own pace. This is your journey, and this is not a diet. This is not a... a a, a prison term. This is not, oh, my life has ended. I'm never going to be able to eat and, and, and eat all the foods that I love. The foods that you love will change. Mm -hmm. and, and the things that you really enjoy. Um, I remember when, you know, when I was a young woman, just like everyone else, I, I loved eating cheeseburgers and pizza and, you know, all the, the typical. Now, um, the, the, the idea of eating those foods ma makes me, uh, feel ill I have no interest in and I don't feel like I'm deprived or I'm a, not not at all I, I I love the foods that I eat and, and they're, they're they're satiating and delicious and exciting for me mm -hmm. um and and I feel great so you know it's a home run <laughs> yeah and I was actually going to ask you um so since your diagnosis back in 1995 with MS and your change to a whole food plant-based diet what would you say is the state of your health now? It's been, I guess, 24 years since that yes, time. Goodness, yes, 24 yeah. years. It might, the state of my health is amazing. I, I don't take any medicine. And um, I uh, uh, am, you know, disability-free. I'm symptom-free. I can't tell. I never say that I'm cured uh, because this is something that I, I manage every day. I can tell you that when I... Um, particularly when I travel a lot or I'm, I'm off my regular schedule. So typically when I wake up in the morning, I practice meditation and then I go for, you know, a run or some type of, or a walk or I exercise early in the morning. If I can't do that for an extended period of time, if I'm traveling or I definitely feel it and, and, and symptoms do uh, come up. But uh, I, you know, at this point, uh, 24, it's nearly 24 years since my diagnosis. Uh, I'm, I'm feeling so, so well and, and, and so energized. And I think that in large part is, is what um, really fuels my, my wanting to, to deliver this message uh, uh, as much as, as possible. And, and I wonder now if we could, uh, as a last question, I kind of want to go into um, a topic. Um, 
where you know you trained um, as an infectious disease specialist, and I wonder um, if do you follow the latest news on superbugs and what can be contributing to the rise of these antibiotic resistant uh, bacteria? Yeah. So yeah, um, I can tell you that uh, this the the idea of these multi drug resistant organisms this has been a problem in the field of infectious diseases for some time, mm -hmm. and it is in large part. Um, and yes, our lifestyle plays a role here, but in, it is in large part uh, with the, uh, regrettably, uh, the overprescribing of antibiotics, particularly in the 80s and 90s, I think. Uh, that was a huge problem. I remember as a, as an, as a fellow um, playing a, a, a huge role in, in trying to sort of rein that in, because what we would do as fellows is we would, we would reach out to you know, surgeons and, and uh, physicians who were prescribing these antibiotics that were really broad spectrum um, and for extended periods of time and trying to, to help them to understand that this was deleterious. If you have a patient with, with a, a simple cellulitis and you put them on a broad spectrum antibiotic, I don't know, something like imipenem or zosin, which are, you know, have very, very broad spectrum, um, you're actually doing a lot of damage because you're, you're destroying a lot of those organisms that are very important, for example, in, in our gut, uh, the gut flora and the microbiome, um, and helping them to understand that it's important to narrow the spectrum so that you can target the organism that is causing the infection and not just wipe out everything. Because when we do that, um, we run into problems. When I, I can tell you that years ago when I was uh, a young attending, something like uh, C. diff um, diarrhea or Clostridium difficile diarrhea was something that we would see only in, in the ICU setting or an older patient that were immunocompromised. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing C. diff diarrhea in, in young patients who have taken a short course of antibiotics. And I think it's because of the, we're sort of reaping the sequelae of over prescription over prescribing antibiotics over many many years mm -hmm. uh, and certainly our lifestyle um, that is defined particularly in our country with the, the poor standard american diet very sedentary behaviors uh, our chronic disease epidemic um you know in large part secondary to to our obesity and our weight issues is is compromising our immune systems mm -hmm. in, in many ways and our immune systems are key and important in maintaining um and reducing our risk of, of infections mm -hmm. so uh these are all I interrelated and um but i think today the issues that we're dealing with today are in large part because of the over prescribing of antibiotics and and the poor lifestyles that we've led in particularly in, in the since the late 1980s. And would you say that um, uh, some medications such as like non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and like proton pump inhibitors, would they have a similar effect on the um, on our gut bacteria that like the disturbance the way that antibiotics do? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and again, for those who are not familiar with the, the microbiome or the gut flora, we have these, uh, th you know, billions of three to five pounds of organisms that live in our gut. Um, and then I always describe it as this community or this neighborhood of organisms. And what we want is we, in order to have a healthy uh, microbiome, we want to have diversity, right? We want to have a, a really a healthy, happy community of bugs, if you can envision that. Um, and what happens is when we when we um, when we make bad choices, like poor poor dietary choices, we change the makeup of those organisms. Mm -hmm. For example, when we eat a diet that is deficient or poor in fiber, uh, interestingly, the good bugs in our in that in that neighborhood they like to feed on fiber. So when we and our diet is largely deficient in fiber, right? The, the average individual probably consumes about 15 grams of fiber. And we really need closer to 26 to 30 grams or even more. Mm -hmm. And so when we eat this, this terrible diet, we're feeding uh, the, the bad bugs and we're, we're keeping the, the good bugs, um, they're, they're starving. They're, they're, they don't have anything to feed on. So we create what we call dysbiosis or an imbalance in, in the healthy makeup of this community or neighborhood of organisms. And, and that's deleterious because these bad bugs produce bad 
chemicals and compounds that then stimulate things like autoimmune diseases and, and uh, chronic diseases and cancer and, and, um, and diabetes. And, and so uh, we're learning a lot about this, this microbiome and, and the makeup of it. And, and, and regrettably, the other uh, approach to, to addressing this is that I think many um, turn to probiotics as the answer to this, the solution to this problem. And that's sort of silly, right? Because we have this big, imagine this big pool of you know, thousands and, and, and billions of, of organisms. And we think by taking a, a probiotic, that's going to deliver a couple of bugs and a pill, like that's like a drop in the bucket. If, you know. So that's not, what we wanna do is we wanna, we want prebiotics, which of course are plant-based options, plant-based foods that are rich in fiber, because what we wanna do is feed the good bugs so that they um, grow and become the, the, the primary uh, component of, of, our, of our gut flora. And when we do that, when we have healthy gut flora, we see that patients, have improved health outcomes. They have re re reduced rates of chronic disease, and and um, and even those patients that are living with chronic diseases, uh, they have improved outcomes. And and it's interesting because there's been a lot of uh, studies in the past year or two looking at the microbiome in MS patients. There was a, a, a small pilot study uh, done in, in Milan. Um, it was published about a year ago, and it was, it's a small study, but it's interesting. They, they took a group of MS patients, and half were placed on a primarily plant-based diet, and the other half on a standard American diet, and they followed them for a year, and then took stool samples. And what they found was that the MS patients who ate the plant-based diet, their uh, microbiome or, or gut flora was enriched with an organism called lacnosphericiae, and that organism produces something called butyrate, which is a short chain fatty acid. And that short chain fatty acid intimately communicates with the immune system and, and sort of turns off um, those B cells and T cells that are, that are playing a role in attacking or stimulating uh, the attack on myelin, which is uh, what happens in multiple sclerosis. So this is, a, this is really very exciting because we're really, trying, we're really now beginning to understand you know, when Swank talked about this in the 1950s, where he said, what you put on your plate is affecting a neurological disease, something that's happening in your brain and spinal cord. Everyone thought he was crazy. Like, how, what are those connections? But now we, we're really beginning to understand it. What you eat affects your microbiome, and your microbiome then interacts with your immune system. And, and these dots are being connected, and it's so exciting uh, to begin to understand the, the science behind, you know, how what we eat affects a disease like MS. Yeah, I, I think it's a it's really great time because uh, you could take something that I think is so intuitive to people that, you know, they know that what they eat has an impact on their health. But now you can look more deeply into seeing what all of those interconnections really are and what the mechanisms are at play. Um, yeah, it's uh, really fantastic. Um, I want to thank you, Dr. Stancic, uh, for coming on and uh, sharing your story and talking to us about uh, your documentary and some of the science behind MS. And, um, and if anybody would like to learn more about your work, uh, they can visit your website, drstancic.com. I'm going to provide the links in the video description. And that you can follow her on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. And you can also visit the uh, codeblueDoc.com um, code to learn more about this incredibly important uh, documentary. So thank you, Dr. Stancic. Thank you so much. It was a great pleasure. <laughs>